Good morning. I am Steve Weber. Welcome to the American Gumption Morning Show. I broadcast with my broadcast partner, Spirituality Gone Wild, typically Monday through Friday, five or four or five days a week. Uh, and it goes uh, live from 10 to 11 a.m. Eastern Time, 7 to 8 a.m. in the Pacific. And you can also watch these shows on the, well, on all of the Spirituality Gone Wild channels, but also on the American Gumption Facebook page and the American Gumption YouTube channel. So, so welcome to uh, Thursday, January 28th, show number 116. Alrighty, so I have a, uh, a fascinating guest coming up, Yolan Brenner. She'll be joining us at about 15 past the hour. And uh, she's got a great story, uh, kind of a wild ride, certainly the the, the path less traveled. Uh, I've kind of, I've kind of, uh, you know, talked about my life being the past path less traveled. And certainly uh, Yolanda and I have uh, that in common in that we, you know, traditional lifestyles or traditional things, ways of doing things, nah, not so much. So anyway, that'll be, that's a fun conversation. I'm looking forward to it. She's a, a wonderful uh, lady and I'm uh, excited to get into some of the, the whole, uh, the, the, her story, but more importantly, you know, uh, the evolution and the, the journey beyond, you know, the, the, her story of um, joining a cult. Yeah, we'll leave it at that. There's a, how's that for a tease? Alrighty. My monologue is going to be, it's titled search for meaning. And, and it's a kind of a combination of what, uh, uh, Yolanda and I will talk about today, but it's also, uh, I'm going to, you know, pick up on the themes from a couple weeks ago when I spoke with Doug Nielsen and we talked about Victor Frankl's book, uh, Man's Search for Meaning. So it's kind of a, a takeoff of that. And I'm going to use some of the Victor Frankl quote. So that'll be coming up in just a, just a couple minutes. So let me tell you what's happening, uh, tomorrow and next week. So, uh, tomorrow I'll, I'll be broadcasting. Uh, I'll be doing a show, but it, I, I don't have a guest schedule. So I'll probably going to just do a monologue and, um, you know, we'll be, ha we'll have a shorter show here on Friday tomorrow. So that's okay. That's always a fun day. And, and I like, I like those days. So that's the plan for tomorrow. Subject to change. We can always change our mind here at, at, uh, at the American gumption show. Now, next week, Monday, Joan of Angels, she's going to come on and do the last segment on Monday. Uh, we have, um, you know, her joining us once uh, once each month. She is part of Spirituality Gone Wild and part of the Untamed Club, our membership site. So so we'll be uh, checking in with her then. Uh, and I'm, uh, I may do extended monologues or some other segments. Uh, still do to be determined. Tuesday, Angie LaRue. Angie LaRue comes back and joins us once more. We'll continue her story, her incredible path less traveled story. Uh, so that's on Tuesday. Wednesday is Nikki Roscoe. She is also returning. Uh, Nikki hasn't been here in about six weeks. And so we're excited to, to welcome Nikki back one more time. She's been a regular guest appearing about once a month on the show, uh, comes to us from London. And uh, Malika, Malika Paranosik, she is a, a composer and out of New York City, and she is going to join us on Thursday and talk about the work she's been doing. So that's going to be a great conversation. All righty, so that's it. Uh, let's go ahead and shift gears. Let's go ahead and get into the um, the the search for meaning. I'll change my banner there. There we go. So, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had Doug Nielsen on the program, and uh, you know, we talked about the life, uh, the philosophy, the the book. Uh, written in 1958 by uh, Viktor Frankl, or maybe 1959, and um, a man's search for meaning. And obviously, it was a you know, it, you know, he was doing his own life story in it. Um, but we'll make it just search for meaning, really, because that's what whether you're a man or you're a woman, we're all searching for meaning in this in this life. I'm going to go ahead and do a screen share. I've got a couple of quotes I want to uh, share with. Whoops, let's see, where did that get to? Oh boy, I got, I lost my, uh, I lost my, my visual. All right, I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm going to, huh, weird. 
All righty, I had the screen all set to go and it disappeared. So I'm not going to bother searching for it. I'm just going to go ahead. I've got a couple of Viktor Frankl quotes that I'm going to, um, you know, mention. And we talked about these last, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago when D uh, Doug was with us. But uh, the first Viktor Frankl quote is between stimulus and response, there is a space. In this space, there is the power to choose our response. In our response lies the growth and our freedom. So, so what Viktor Frankl was talking about is that things happen to us, external things happen to us, and we have a we respond to them. And and Victor talks about this little tiny space. It could just be a fraction, you know, a fraction of a second. He says that space allows us to decide what we want to do. And if we are living a subconscious life, right, if we're on autopilot, then what we're doing is re, re, we're reacting. But if we are living a more conscious life and aware of what we want to do, we recognize that space. And then we, we have a chance to respond as opposed to react. And, and so a lot of people, and certainly me, for the first 50 years of my life, I was lived a very subconscious life. And, you know, I spent a lot of time reacting. Things would happen and boom, you just sort of, you know, you go into that program and you react certain ways. And uh, what Viktor Frankl in that quote is really saying is that if we can recognize that little bit of space and we can take uh, control of that space and then respond as op opposed to reacting, then, then we, um, you know, that's where the growth and the freedom in our life comes from. Uh, the second quote he has is everything can be taken from a man, but one thing, the last of human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances to choose one's own way. Now, Viktor Frankl was in a, a concentration camp in World War II. Uh, and so they had stripped him of everything, you know, his food, his clothing, his, I mean, he was down to just being, you know, a bare naked man with, with no food, no water. I mean, beating him and, Yet he was had the presence of mind to say, you can't take away my freedom to choose how I want to respond to what you're doing to me. And so he maintained that belief. And that's what kept him alive. He recognizes that in his book or acknowledges that in his book, that, that that's what allowed him to survive that, is he knew that he had the freedom to respond and to to respond in in and choose his own attitude toward it. So somehow he had this incredible strength and he was able to bear and hold up under the, you know, the torture that he was really living in. And finally, the last quote I'll say, I'll say this is the shortest one, easiest to get is our greatest freedom is our freedom to choose our attitude. Our greatest freedom is our freedom to choose our attitude. And, um, yeah, so that's what Victor was talking about. That's that response. That's that space where we get to choose how we want to respond. And in that space and in that choice becomes the the growth that we have in it. And so, uh, you know, there was a time when things would happen and I'd get angry and I'd get mad and I'd lash out. And and I, uh, I, I, I like to think I'm past most of that, but there's still, you know, every day is a challenge, right? Every day is a day when you, you know, you have that choice to, to keep reacting or, or to, to react to the stimulation that comes at us. So I, I wanted to, I, you know, I was inspired by the, the conversation I'm going to have with Yolande coming up here in that you know, one of the th ways that she describes herself is on her website is the asker of big questions, the asker of big questions. I love that. Uh, you know, she, you know, she's, she, what is, she's searching for her own, uh, you know, search for meaning. She wants to understand what is this meaning of life? What is this purpose? And she was asking these questions, you know, you know, early on in her life and that led her down a path that, you know, she's going to tell us all about, um, Victor Frankl, of course, was asking the big questions when he wrote Man's Search for Meaning. That, you know, the search for meaning really is, it's probably the biggest question that one can ask. You know, what is our life purpose? What are what are we here to do? And, and, and the commonality is that, you know, both, uh, you know, what Victor was talking about and, and Yolande, what she wrote about in her, in her memoir and what we're going to talk about is, is really about like, how do you make a difference in the world? How do you, you know, do something that's important and instead of just, you know, 
going and you know going through the monotony or the routine of life. And so so this is the the idea of what the bigger question is. What is the purpose here? Now, um, because of my Forrest Gump connection, I'm going to you know refer back to the movie here. And and this is the way I would always end my my keynotes uh, when I talk is I would I would show uh, the the scene where Forrest is talking to Mama on um, on her deathbed and and Mama's just sort of you know Forrest you know we we see him like rush home and you know get up into the room and sit down in the chair and what's wrong Mama and and she says oh I'm dying I'm dying all oh, that and she's trying to reassure her son that that's okay dying is just a part of life she tells him um, and and she as she's talking and telling reflecting on her life story she says she says um i didn't know it at the time but i was destined to be your mama i didn't know it at the time but i was destined to be your mama and that word destined you know it catches forest and he says and he almost pleads with her he says mama what's my destiny mama what's my destiny and really what Forrest was asking was the big question. Uh, he was doing the search for meaning and he was saying, hey, you know, what's my purpose here in life? You know, what's my destiny? And Mama very wisely and very calmly says, uh, Forrest, you're going to have to figure it out for yourself. And, and that was really great advice because there was nothing else. If she had said anything like, oh, you're supposed to go do this or yours, you know, he, ultimately we don't want to be told what to do by others. We want to figure it out ourselves. And, and when mama said, Forrest, it's, you know, you're just going to have to figure it out yourself. She gave him the best advice. She didn't give him an answer, you know, other than, Hey, go figure it out yourself. And, and that's what, that's what asking big questions is. And that's what Victor Frankel in the, in the search for meeting, what, uh, you know, was, was talking about. So there are no, you know, there's no easy answers to anything of, of these questions. Nobody can give us the answer. We have to discover it. You know, we have to figure it out for ourselves along the path of life. And, uh, uh, we all get to choose our meaning and we get to answer our own big question, you know, that, that big question of what's our purpose here, what's our destiny. Uh, we get to go figure it out ourselves. Uh, and, and, you know, just to kind of wrap up and conclude uh, this before I bring your on, I, I, you know, I, I now can look at the 10 years that I was in Montana as really, you know, me, uh, my time of being able to ask the big question and how grateful am I that, you know, I had the better part of 10 years to, you know, uh, in, in the simplest form, sit on the side of the, the hill looking at the mountains and asking, okay, what is, uh, you know, what is my destiny? What is my purpose? And, and, and it's funny because I moved to Montana with a very definitive, like, here's what I'm going to do. And, um, and none of that worked out right from the beginning, the whole you know, the whole plan started to unravel. And, uh, and of course, from the time that I decided to move there until I actually got there was a several year period. And, and my own ambitions and my own, you know, interpretation of what kind of life I wanted to live had evolved and changed during that time. And so I had this old vision that I was trying to fit into this new evolving vision. And, and, and then, you know, the, the 2008 stock market, the housing crash and, you know, everything, you know, kind of went haywire at that same time that I was in the, the process of getting there and reestablishing it. So all the plans that I had kind of went out the window right at that moment. And then I had to, to come up with new ones. And, and so Fast forward 10 years later when I finally said, I got, I'm out of here. And, and it wasn't like I'm out of here, like I can't take this place. It was more like I was out of there because um, the work that I had come to do in Montana was finished. And, and it, while I didn't, I don't want to claim that you ever have it all figured out, I had gotten to the point where I went, okay, the reason why I came here, the reason to sit here and stare at the mountain and figure out what my destiny is, you know, I had reached the, the conclusion and, and that's where I am with the American Gumption Project and out on the road, uh, you know, for the next couple of years. So, so that all came. And, and I remember the last thing I'll say about all of this is I remember telling a real good friend when I was uh, leaving and it was kind of the only person that I, I was a little nervous about telling because he was, committed to the area. And uh, he had been my best friend and my, you know, advisor and, you know, just some, a true confidant that that guided me throughout the, the entire time that I was in Montana, introduced me to people, 
made me help me become part of the community. And, um, and so I told him that I was leaving and he said, Oh man, he was disappointed. And then he said, I feel like you're running away. And, and I, um, and I didn't say anything. I, I allowed that little space that Viktor Frankl talked about and I didn't say anything. Uh, and I recognized that he was just, you know, disappointed that, um, you know, his friend was leaving. And so I, I didn't say anything. I went home and I thought about it and I was like, am I running away? And am I really running away from it? Am I giving up on this dream? And, and what I realized that is that, you know, the dream had kind of, you know, 10 years earlier passed me by and I was living that last 10 years trying to, you know, figure out what to go do next as opposed to that dream. And, and so the conclusion I came to was that, no, I'm not running away. I'm running towards and running towards the American Gumption Project, which is what I'm out there doing now. And, and that it just wasn't, you know, it, I wasn't able to get there to the American Gumption Project from, from, I wasn't ready. To, I wasn't able to get to where I wanted to go from there. So it was time to leave there and go back out into the world. So I was not running away. I was running towards. And, and that was a great feeling because once you realize that you're running towards, you know, you're doing it with intention and purpose uh, as opposed to uh, reaction and, and hope, blind hope, blind faith. Alrighty. So that's that. Let's go ahead uh, and welcome uh, our guest, I see Yolanda is in the green room. I hope she's been enjoying the American gumption snacks that we provided back there. <laughs> Yolanda Brenner, welcome to the American Gumption Morning Show. Thank you. It's good to be here. So, Yolanda, we have two little things that happen right when the when I welcome a new guest onto the show. And so hopefully you'll um, be a cooperative guest and allow me to do both of those things. Uh, the first one is I like to read a little bio and introduce people to who you are. And then I have a theme song that I play. Uh, and the theme song is called, coincidentally, the first time guest to the American Gumption Show theme song. So I will play that. Is that, are, are you willing to go along with this? Absolutely, that sounds great. Alrighty, so, so Yolanda Brenner is a writer, actress, singer, filmmaker, teacher, and author of her memoir, Holy Candy, Why I Joined a Cult and Married a Stranger. Her search for love and meaning has led to unexpected places, adventures into the realms of relationships and this, the discovery of her own spirituality. Yolande has studied creative writing at City University of New York City College. She has an advanced certificate in filmmaking from Central St. Martins and a BA in fine art and film filming from East London University. You are well educated. I don't she know. She is a media and communication professional skilled in memoir, camera, film, documentaries, and editing. It's safe to call Yolande a creative. I'm going to call you a creative, Yolande. Is that okay? That sounds great. Yes, I consider myself that. And she also has a couple of day jobs. Yolande is an adjunct assistant professor and English lecturer at local New York City colleges. She is a freelance teleprompter teleprompter operator who has worked in broadcast television for 25 plus years. You know your way around the uh, back end of a broadcast studio. That's right. I see you've done some research there. <laughs> and uh, uh, Yolanda also has two adult children and a lifetime, a lifetime of adventures along her path less traveled. I love that. You have done the path less traveled. So we have that in common. Uh, why go down the traditional path? That's kind of boring. Well, I think all paths are interesting as long as they're the ones you've chosen. And even if they're not, something good comes out of it. All righty. Well, very good. Well, we're going to get into all of that. Yolan Brenner, welcome to the American Gumption Morning Show. Let me go ahead and play this uh, theme song, and then we'll get into our conversation.
<laughs> Have you ever had a marching band welcome you to a show before, Yolande? That is a first, absolutely. <laughs> Very nice, thank you. <laughs> All righty, well, good. Well, welcome. We're glad that you're here and. Uh, uh, we're gonna we, we're just gonna have a conversation we're gonna talk a little bit about your you know we're gonna obviously start out with the um, you know the book uh, your memoir and you're really you're about you know almost 20 years past when this whole you know I uh, we'll call it kind of crazy chapter of your life uh, w went on. Um, so let's just go ahead and kind of start, you know, jump into the beginning of it. Um, you know, you're or, or somewhere around 1990, you're just finishing up at the university in London and you're, you know, you're at this point where you're like, I want to do something special in my life, but you're, you know, like, like all of us or like many of us at certain points in time, we go, you know, what is my purpose in life? What am I supposed to be doing here? And, uh, and you know, you ended up meeting someone who, you know, introduced you to uh, the, the Unification Church. I mean, what happened back then? Where was your mindset and, you know, what was going on when that all began? Uh, as you say, a lot of people around that age do look for those answers to those big questions. And I was actually working on a documentary with some friends of mine, uh, Fiona and Sarah. We were making a documentary called Soul Searching, and that was how I met this person who was in the Principal Life Study Center. But I think that I really was doubting that I was following my true path because I always felt like there was something missing. There was a member of my family who had a serious mental illness and it made me wonder what a person really is. You are born into a certain place. People expect you to do certain things and accomplish certain things. And I think there comes a point in everybody's life that when they wonder, is that really what I'm here to do? Uh, I guess you could call it a quarter life crisis though. Some people talk about that when you're coming up to your mid twenties and you wonder, is this really the path that I'm supposed to be following? And uh, another part of it was that I always had an ideal of having a true eternal love or a real romance. You know, I was raised on fairy tales and romantic novels and uh, I found that the reality was very different and I was passionately in love with a man that I had been in a relationship with for several years and uh, it wasn't working out. So when we met this person at the Principal Life Study Center who said that he had the answer to what true eternal love was, I was really hooked. When you, uh, your, your life up until that point, did you feel like you're, you know, like, 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 did you feel like you had a lot of choices in terms of like going off to university and, you know, studying theater and film and that whole thing? Did you, you know, were you feeling like you had options and choices up until then? Or were you, were you kind of like pushed along the way, um, so to speak? And, you know, I guess I'm, I'm wondering your mindset where you, yeah, so Right. Well, on, honestly, Steve, I felt like I did have choices. And I even before I joined the church, I made some choices that people didn't think were the best choices. For example, I think that a lot of my family members would have liked me to pursue something more academic or scientific. But I left school early to go to art school, uh, which I felt was a good choice. I already had left home quite young, around the age of 16, to go and pursue my dreams of being an artist in London. And I actually had a lot of opportunities when I was a young woman. I was invited to model in pop videos by the Smiths and Boy George and in magazines. And I was even in a couple of movies. I was in a Peter Greenaway movie and a Derek Jarman movie. And I felt like, at the time, I felt like I would always have those choices. And uh, in fact, I felt like the world was limitless to me, to be quite honest. It, it, it's interesting because you, you know, you, it, it sounds like, you know, the family was, was supportive, but at the same time, they probably would have preferred that you uh, became a doctor or some kind of a academic scientific pursuit. And this whole artsy thing, this creative lifestyle that you wanted to go pursue um, was, um, you know, a little bit far out. Uh, did they think that, you know, was your relationship with them strained at that point or was it, you know, they were just accepting of it? Because I know that once you kind of joined the church, then it became at least a, you know, more of a strained relationship. So before that. 
Uh, it's complicated because my family was already separated in some way and I would say that perhaps one half of them wanted me to pursue that academic lifestyle but um, my mother is in fact an artist herself uh, and so for her she was a big dreamer and I don't think that it affected our relationship that much. Uh, certainly after I joined the church I wasn't supposed to be in contact with my family or friends at all. Great. Okay. So, so then, um, you know, I, and I've, I, maybe I, I, I've got some pictures, maybe I'll just throw them up then and then, and then we'll let you tell the story as it uh, goes along. So let, give me just one second. We'll, we'll do this. Uh, okay. Do you want me to do a bit of narrating here, Steve? Let's see here. Uh, there we go. So, yeah. So there okay. is a picture of you and the, and the lucky, the lucky groom. That's right. I don't think he thought he was that lucky at that time. I think he was almost ready to run away. Uh, we'd met a few days earlier to Korea. So that's us in the middle of uh, the Seoul Olympic Stadium in the 30,000 couples wedding. Uh, this is in 1992. And this picture is taken after people had started to empty out. We are newly married, uh, not allowed to consummate our marriage for a couple of years after that. But uh, there we are. The happy couple. I did not realize. I was thinking this took place in in the United States. I was thinking it was like Yankee Stadium or something. But they flew you all over to uh, to Korea to have the wedding. Absolutely, they did, and we stayed in the Olympic Stadium uh, where there was a dorm like situation. Uh, there's the North American team. Uh, the next picture you were showing. Um, this is the team of people that I spent most of my life with in the U.S. Uh, well, about half of the men and half of the women there. Uh, some people I was very close to, uh, you know, day and night, we lived together, we slept together, we ate together, and uh, we're all newly married there to people that none of us know. And mm. uh, and, th and then here's uh, you in a, a moment of uh, uh, joy on your wedding day. Right. Yes. There I am on my wedding day uh, in our matching dresses. We all had identical hundred dollar dresses there. Uh, they weren't the most flattering, but uh, it made quite an effect on the floor. That's one of my good friends on my left that I spent a good deal of time with and uh, her partner to my right. Uh -huh. uh, yes. Wow. And so let's see the last uh yeah, the last picture. Here's a, a you and you and two other brides that day. Yes, this is uh, two of my church sisters that I spent an awful lot of time with. Uh, as I say, day and night, working together, sleeping together, praying together, and uh, we were very close. We had all just got married, and I think we were just in a state of shock and trying to get used to the fact that uh, now we were going to spend the rest of our lives not only our physical lives, but our spiritual lives with these men that we had just met. And uh, of course we wouldn't be physically intimate with them for some years to come. So yeah, it's just the beginning of a journey there. That's, that's certainly not the traditional way of doing things, but Hey, so you, you, you and, and you had met, um, you know, you initially it happened a couple years earlier where you, in, you were still in London and then you, you ended up um, getting sent to the U.S. because um, because of some you know things that happened, and you started this new life in in the United States here in the early twenties, and then another year or so later after that, that's when you went over to uh, Seoul and got married uh, with sixty thousand other people from around the world. I guess that's right. Uh, I think there were about one hundred and forty different nationalities there. So, uh, yes, it had been a couple of years since I had joined the church when I went to the wedding. Um, and as you say, I was sent over from London. I joined in London. And of course, all of my close family members and friends were in London. I would say almost, you know, are my closest friends still there. And uh, so because my ex-boyfriend at the time was trying to kidnap me and... Uh, doing various damage to the uh, buildings then uh, not only that, but I, I think they made a decision that they, America was the most important country in the world, according to the church. And so we were sent here to do this mission. 
Wow. Wow. So uh, uh, when you first got here to the U.S., I mean, what were you doing then um, before you went off and got married? I mean, what was your life like those first few months and, you know, when you got here? Uh, I, I want to make this sound interesting, but honestly, my life in the church was a mixture of two things. One of them was begging for money and selling small items for money to give to the church that I would go out and do every day and trying to get people to join the church. And uh, though that was what I did all day, every day. And uh, that was it. That was my life in the church. Here's a, uh, let's see if I can, here's a picture of, uh, let's see if I can do this properly. There we go. Uh, this looks like a holiday party, but it also looks like maybe what you were doing on a daily basis, just like hanging out like places, trying to draw up attention to, you know, to, to the cause. Right. This was the Brooklyn Church Center uh, with some of my good friends there, my brothers. Uh, we were trying to draw people into these meetings uh, that, they always had a different name. The Women's Federation for World Peace was, of course, a part of the Unification Church. And uh, we would provide food and bring people in from the neighborhood. And yeah, that was uh, one of the things that we did on a regular basis. Uh, there I am on a at a church meeting. Uh, I'm on the right. That's one of the uh, higher members of the church. It's a little blurred there. <laughs> Yeah, and then here it looks like you're uh, you're you're preaching the good word. That's right. There I am preaching the good word, <laughs> <laughs> uh, trying to persuade people to join us. Uh, not doing a very good job, I think. <laughs> and and here's your uh, you mentioned the piece, uh, women's women's federation for world peace. I mean, hey, who doesn't want to you know who doesn't want world peace? I mean, this all sounded like a good good cause and and worthy. Absolutely. Yeah, that's right. Who doesn't want world peace and eternal Absolutely. love? But uh, we we had good intentions. Yeah. So so um, so you go and you get married, and and I, two years pass, and now you're allowed to consummate the marriage, and then you have a couple of kids, and and you're it, you know this is all you're back in the you know you're back in New York living your life. Um, and uh, you know now you have these couple of young kids, and and it sounded um, like you, your, your husband, you, you know, was more committed to the church at that point than you were. And you became committed to these kids. I mean, you said like, like I'm, I'm their mother. I need to raise these children properly. And, and it was more fun for you to raise your children than it was to do what the church wanted you to do. Is that a fair assessment? I would uh, say that I was committed to the church at that time, even though I wasn't as actively spending all day fundraising or witnessing, I still was dedicated to the church, dedicated to the marriage, and I absolutely had made my decision that I was going to stay in that marriage forever. Um, my husband had some other ideas about how we should live our life at one point. He moved us all to his hometown in Ecuador, and we... Uh, he wanted to set up our um, own ministry there for the church, uh, which I found very difficult. Um, so I think that I was dedicated to the church, but of course it was more fun to spend time with my children. I didn't send my children to the church schools or the church daycare. I sent them to uh, public schools and uh, at a certain point, my uh, ex-husband now just decided that uh, it wasn't going the way that he wanted it to go, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm not sure what how to define that in a in a useful way. <laughs> right, right. Or, yeah. are, are you still? I did not know about Ecuador. Uh, you, you're living in uh, Quito or somewhere like that. Uh, we lived in a place called La Moya, which is in the mountains near Chimborazo. Okay. It's very beautiful. Uh, it was a big transition. It was a big change to make. It was a place where at the time there wasn't always clean water. We had to go and collect it from a running stream. Uh, there wasn't always electricity. There certainly wasn't telephone connection, things like that. So mm -hmm. it was a big change for me. And uh, I think my son, who was only one at the time, didn't really think that much of it because he was so young but my daughter who was three it was more difficult for her 
because she was not used to that way of life. Uh, yeah. It, uh, did uh, did you know any Spanish? Oh yes. Okay. Yes, I I was. I was able to speak in Spanish. Very good. Uh, so, so were, when your husband decided that the marriage was over and now you're on your own with the kids, were you still living in uh, Ecuador at the time? No, we had uh, we ran out of money in Ecuador, <laughs> so <laughs> we came back to the church building that we'd left, which was actually the New Yorker Hotel. Uh, at the time, it was full of church members living there. I don't know if anybody who lives in New York knows it. It's on the thirty fourth and eighth, and it's now New York uh, Ramada or something else. Anyway, so we were living there and we went back and said, look, we, we've we come back and they didn't have a space for us. And uh, so we were there temporarily and uh, then we were kicked out and then we moved to Harlem. And I think it was really moving away from the church that made it clear to us that we weren't a good match because our relationship was always tied up with doing things for other people, being a part of a community and having all these other church members around. And then, well, when we were in Ecuador, we had his whole family around and then it was just him and me and the children mm -hmm. in this apartment in Harlem. And uh, things did not last very long after that. All righty, well, good. So I think, um, thank you for sharing that part of it. Um, I don't want to dwell any more on that. I. I <laughs> But in terms of just, you know, talking about, you know, how does one reclaim their life and, um, you know, end up making decisions for themselves and, and looking internally for the answers. Uh, it's kind of important that we, you know, talked a little bit about that and laid it out. So thanks for your willingness to share it. And again, it's, you know, it's 20, 20 years ago when yeah. all possible, when all this was happening. And so, um, you know, you're well past, you know, the delicate stage of like just re-emerging from it. Um, so, so he leaves and then, you know, you, at that point, you realize that the church did, doesn't have the answers and um, you describe them as a lie, but let's just say that, you know, it just wasn't, it was their interpretation of what the truth was. And, and but it was no longer working for you as the truth, and it was no longer practical for you to you know be thinking that this was the answer. So then, how do you pick up the pieces? How do you start to assemble your life back together at that point? And uh, I mean, there had to be a little bit of a dark night of the soul moment. Oh my goodness! I wish I had a really uplifting and great answer to this question. <laughs> and I and I actually I should go back and look at that website because. I say, I ask me questions, and I think that recently I may have come to the conclusion that there really aren't answers, set answers. Mm -hmm. I think everybody can make their own answers. So how did I deal with it? Um, gosh, I think that initially I just, uh, I wanted to take as many chances as I could to see whether I really would be struck down as the church had said I would if I didn't follow the rules. But over time, I have found things that I enjoy doing. And I think that I've realized for myself that the things that really bring me happiness when I look back on them are really small things that I didn't plan, like a day that I spent the whole day in the park with my children or just really small moments that I share with people that I love. I don't think that any of the really big things I've attempted are the answer to what happiness is for me. I think I've veered off from your question, but it, it's been a long journey and I don't think that I have a great answer because I think that I always wanted there to be a way of life that was the path to happiness. And so you do these things and then you're happy and you've found the solution and everything is going wonderfully and it's like this way of magical thinking that I sort of believe in the law of attraction that what you focus on you create and I still believe in that in a way but I think going back to what you said in the beginning which was one of your quotes from Viktor Frankl that uh, to choose one, one's attitude is in any set of circumstances is perhaps one of the most meaningful things you can do and I think that even now that is one of the most difficult things to do. And I, I wish that it, I could say it's become easier. I wish that I could say that with greater freedom, it's easier. But I think 
that it's I'm always the same whether I'm in a cult or whether I'm out you know whether I'm completely free and uh I think that it still comes down to whether I am choosing the way that I react to what happens because there are always going to be some fantastic things that happen and just it seems like just when you've gotten used to a way of being something always comes up and breaks it down for you and uh so I think it just comes down to that like how can you choose your attitude how can you choose to be happy or choose to be content when you know that things are not necessarily going to work out the way that you want them to. I didn't even answer to your question at all. I just went. Yeah, no, no, no. That's uh, it's um, it, it's a journey. So, so one of the, the, the life lessons from the movie the, and really probably the most important one from the Forrest Gump movie that of course I'm uh, a bit of an expert in uh, it said, it's just a journey. It just keeps going and you never get anywhere. And, and the whole story of Forrest Gump is just his life. He just travels from, from, you know, episode to episode to episode. And, uh, and, and I've used that teaching as a way of like, we go through different chapters and we evolve to the next chapter and, and then we learn to live in that chapter. And then we evolve to the next chapter. And, and of course in the movie, uh, Forrest seamlessly moves from one chapter to the next. And in real life, it's more difficult to move from one chapter to the next. And that's the challenge. That's the, the part of being a human that uh, we are all dealing with and learning from. I, I think there might be some people out there who find it all very easy. And if so, I'd like to hear from them. But uh, <laughs> I, Yes. Well, I, if you want to, if you have the answer, uh, <laughs> Yolanda, Yolanda Brenner, uh, Yolanda Brenner com. You can easily reach out to her just as I did. And, and we, we got connected and we're having this conversation. So she's, a, um, you know, please feel free to, to reach out and visit Yolanda's website. So there. We'll Thank, you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah. Yes, and um, it's it's funny that you talk about the different chapters because I actually really identified with one of the things you said earlier that Forrest's mom said that her destiny was to have her children. I'm sorry, mm. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna feel sad here now because I feel like um, even because of the weird choices that I made, I had these two amazing children mm -hmm. and I feel like that may be why I was felt so strongly that I wanted to do that, that I didn't listen to logic, I just did it. So I do feel in a way that my destiny was to have my children, but now my children are adults, they have their own lives. And it's something that you know is happening. And uh, if there are other people in the same situation who are listening, I'm, I'm sure they identify, you don't, you don't think about the next chapter because then you have to recreate yourself again. And I think life is like that. You have to keep recreating what your purpose is. And uh, maybe you don't always know. <laughs> so. No. And, and the, the big question uh, needs to keep being asked and, and answered, you know, again, as you get to each chapter, the, the, maybe it becomes easier. Um, but in, you know, maybe it doesn't, maybe some, you know, we're faced with these challenges of just being human, uh, day in and day out. And so each, uh, and, and if we can look at the big, I, I, I just liked your big, big question. I mean, that really what it comes down to, if we can answer that, it would be so much easier <laughs> if we knew that. And, and so anyway, uh, well, good. Um, hey, I've, I've got just a couple more pictures. We're going to do a little flashback here. Let's mm -hmm. do a screen share one more time here. And you can just tell us about this chapter of your life. I guess this is the modeling and it looks like yep. uh, Simon Costin's jewelry, a goth magazine. Tell us about that chapter of your life. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is when I was uh, still studying. And uh, so this is one of the things I got asked to model for. Uh, Simon Costin is an absolutely amazing uh, jewelry designer. He has works in the Victorian Albert now. Um, and he invited me to do this photo shoot. Uh, it was just a lot of fun. Um, so that's what that was from. Uh, here's, a, here's another picture from that same, uh, uh, looks oh, like yeah, the same photo shoot. Photo shoot. Yeah, yeah, I, I love his work. It is incredible, uh, yeah. You uh, and going back to that first picture, I I saw a video. Uh, your ha hair was quite short there. You kind of had the kind of had the Forrest Gump haircut at that time. I right. I um I actually had had uh, 
long hair and uh, my boyfriend at the time <laughs> had this idea to shave it off. He actually shaved it off um, for a Smiths video that I was also in. Um, at the time, uh, I was living in this big Victorian house in Guildford Street in London, and uh, Simon Costin was one of the people who lived there. There were loads of artists and designers, and it was just uh, actually a really exciting time. Uh, yeah. I, I think I even saw a uh, video on your website uh, where um, it was a Boy George video, and you were one of the uh, dancing extras or something. Right. I don't think that video is widely seen, but um, I, I was in that video that was made by John Mabry, who was an absolutely incredible filmmaker. Also, uh, he was a part of that group in London at the time. Um, yeah, so that was that was another fun thing that I did. Uh, now, that is, is, uh, is this uh, this this picture and then and then and this one here? Or is this an, uh, another modeling shoot? But is this at that same time? Is this still back in London? Right, that's at the same time. And um, this is a photo shoot for uh, Alistair Thane, who is an amazing photographer uh, for Ectomorph magazine. I forget who the designer was. Uh, I believe these photos were actually taken. I'm not sure, but I think they were taken in Guildford Street. Uh, hmm. Yeah, so that was and, what that was for. And the last picture I have here, <laughs> here's a, a colorful, you were a, a bit of a clown uh, uh, makeup artist. Right, uh, well, I didn't do that makeup. That was a makeup <laughs> artist who decided to do that. Um, I forget what magazine that was for, but uh, yeah, there that was a photo shoot. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. there, well, uh, fun, fun times um, back in the in the early days. Uh, yes. So you're, so you're this creative, and then and you're searching for the meaning. You go off, and you end up getting married. You have these kids. Your destiny. Uh, now the kids are grown up. I mean, the last couple of years you've been teaching English, uh, uh, creative writing. I'm assuming. Uh, yes, I teach uh, English composition, English literature, uh, writing for the humanities, and uh, yeah, I. That's what I write, teach, and uh, I love it. I absolutely love teaching. I get so much inspiration from my students. They keep me in touch with uh, latest trends, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it really gives me a lot of joy teaching. You, you, you know, I often hear parents talk about uh, that their their uh, their children become some of their best teachers. Uh, and what you just said about your students, I'm assuming that the students become the teacher's teacher. They teach me so much. I honestly have found that my students are so caring as people. Uh, they're so considerate of each other. They're really ambitious and uh, just very genuine. And I am always moved by how pure they are and just how much love they show to each other. And even, you know, to me as an instructor, they're very considerate to me and I, I, I love their ideas. They always are coming up with fresh ideas and they have such a great perspective on life, even though they're all going through this really difficult situation of learning online and not meeting their peers in person they found a way to make the online community really vibrant and supportive. So I, I appreciate them immensely. Is it safe to say that the, the students uh, have adapted to uh, online teaching much better than the, the teachers and the people who look at them? And, you know, cause I hear, you know, I hear say, Oh, these poor students, uh, you know, they're missing out on it. And, and while that's true, um, you know, I'm hearing you say that they're adapting and they, you know, it's just becoming a new normal for them, maybe. I don't know. I think I'm trying to look at the positive of it, but also they do tell me that they are suffering from anxiety, many, many of them. And I, I know that they miss meeting in person. And I think that they also, of course, are suffering from not having that human face to face connection in real life. But I, I think they're very dealing with it in a very positive way, and I have a lot of hope for them. In this past year, uh, like like go back to March a year ago, uh, were you in the middle of a semester or in a teaching period, and suddenly you had to shift instantly to online? Right. 
did, did is that the way it worked for you? Yes, uh, yes. So I was in uh, in the middle of March. I was teaching face to face in a classroom in a couple of classrooms, uh, and I was also working uh, at CBS. And everything happened in one week because in one week in March, a couple of people at the place where I worked uh, were tested positive. And I, at the time, I didn't take it that seriously. Honestly, I didn't really know how serious it was going to become. And I just couldn't really believe it when we were sent home and told that we would not be there indefinitely. And uh, the same with the college. So we all had to shift to teaching online very quickly. Luckily, I had already done some online teaching, so I felt somewhat prepared, but I know that a lot of people were not prepared. And uh, I didn't find it too difficult of a transition, honestly, but... Uh, definitely it wasn't what I expected. And I know that some of the students at that time did find it really hard to adapt, but uh, we just carried on. You've, um, and then the other thing that you do uh, professionally uh, is a uh, teleprompt operator. I've never met a teleprompt <laughs> operator before. Um, and maybe, you know, just tell us what that's like for people who wonder, well, what, you know, we have an image of what that would be like, but what does a teleprompt operator do? How does it? How okay. does it <laughs> it's an interesting job. So a teleprompt operator really uh, just scrolls the script for the news uh, readers, for any kind of talent for a talk show or a sports show. And uh, I got into the job almost by accident because uh, although I did study film and television, my uh, I, the, the Unification Church had a television studio that they started uh, around 1991 in the New Yorker Hotel. Um, it was under the guise of Manhattan Center. And so they had a 24 hour news talk television show. And uh, at the time they asked me to do it because I had some experience of TV and also I was a good typist and I, I didn't intend to do it, but uh, here I am 25 years later and I'm still doing it. And uh, it's, it's an interesting job. Uh, it's fairly straightforward, but uh, it is uh, it is a skill. People don't think about it, but as a teleprompter operator, you have to be able to really focus in a very hectic environment, uh, focus on what's important, which is what the producers want, how they want the show to go, and what the talent themselves are thinking and heading to next. And you almost have to be a bit of a mind reader to know what's gonna happen next sometimes in a live situation. But uh, yeah, that's what a teleprompter operator does. Yeah, one of the things that I've, I've heard, um, and, and this is more like from a political um, environment where you know you have the candidate who's, who's talking, you know, the operator needs to be able to speed up or slow down depending on, you know, the pace that the, but there's no like, like, like there's never any like, Hey, can you hurry that up a little bit? Or can you slow that down a little bit? It just <laughs> has to happen kind of like on that mind sync and you need to, I mean, I, I guess if you get to know that the talent or, and you get to know the producers and you understand what they are thinking, then it becomes a bit easier, but otherwise I imagine it's a bit hectic. Well, absolutely. One, if you work in a particular show for some time, you get used to the speed and the general flow of things. Uh, and as you say, some hosts will skip over things and they'll go to the next point or they'll speak very fast. Or if they speak slowly, it's not as much of a problem. But um, yeah, that's the thing. And they would hopefully never say it on air. Um, now, because some we have a lot of hosts who are operating remotely by satellite, some of them are far away from where the teleprompter is actually running from. So occasionally in the break, they'll say there's a bit of a lag or something, and uh, we just do the best we can to keep up with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, interestingly, this particular show that I'm doing is there's no producer other than me. There's no uh, back. Uh, there's no um, operator or. Um, engineer who's who's clicking the buttons and so uh the first month that i started i had quite a, a problem because uh you know just remembering where the buttons were you know you could see me thinking on air in terms of like oh i gotta do that and and these little tiny hesitations seemed like in my mind like such dramatic <laughs> And, and now I'm just sort of, you just sort of roll with it. And, and I, I, you know, in, in this case, I wanted to put your, your banner up uh, at the beginning of your segment, but about three or four 
eight minutes into it, I realized, oh my gosh, I didn't switch that. So you just do it and, and that sort of thing. But in broadcast television, things are pretty, they want to keep it kind of scripted and, uh, you know, running tight and they have a plan. And, and so it takes multiple people to do all those things, uh, as opposed to this, which is a little more of a, you know, kind of an ad lib thing. Um, anyway. Right. Yeah, no, that's interesting. And I, and I think that even going into this situation, I, I, I've thought about it because I know that when I have been interviewed for a television show or something, they want something very pointed. So they want, a particular effect, whether it's they want somebody to come to tears or they want something, a very emotional moment, or they want something that has to happen very fast. So it's it's more of a challenge for me thinking about this where we're just kind of having a chat because I keep thinking, well, am I getting to the point fast enough? But um, I think it's great to have this organic kind of way of just seeing where it will go. And uh, I don't think that people notice, and even in broadcast TV, sometimes, of course, there'll be a technical hitch and people just carry on. It happens. One of the, uh, I love, the right word was organic uh, in what we're doing here. And that's, I think that that's kind of becoming a new uh, acceptable form of communication because there's lots of lots of people like myself who are, you know, creating these different types of shows. And, and one of the wonderful things about uh, this last year is that it's mainstreamed the idea of doing a, a person's not like, you're not in the studio with me. Uh, and that's become like the normal thing. And so the, the connection and the quality of the connection isn't as good as obviously as if you're at the studio. And, and so what happened is we've gotten used to that. The public has gotten used to the fact that, you know, these images are going to be a little grainy at times and maybe the, the sound clicks out, which, you know, is, but a year ago we thought, Oh, this is unprofessional. We can't, you know, we can't put this kind of product out. And yet that's what broadcast television is doing every day now. That's right. I think people have gotten used to the fact that it will sometimes be like that. And sometimes the image will just freeze and you'll have to go to the next person. And uh, it just happens now. Yeah. 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 Well, good. Well, this was fun, uh, Yolan. Thank you so much. What, um, you know, I, I would encourage people to go to your, your website to learn more about you. I'm, I'm guessing that you're going to continue your journey and this reinvention. You are a creative, so you're not going to just, uh, you know, settle into something mundane. I can't imagine that that's going to be your life. Uh, but what do you see as next? What would you, what would you hope to, you know, accomplish in, as you go forward? I really want to focus more on my artistic pursuits. Of course, teaching is very important to me. I'm working on a graphic memoir version of my book, Holy Candy. And uh, I've also been doing some short video collaborations with a friend of mine in England, uh, which I really enjoy doing. So, uh, who knows what will happen next? But yeah, your your friend that that you uh, have done these. I saw one uh, a couple of the editing is. What do you call that style? Where like from a sound point of view, you're doing like an overdubbing and a like almost like a staccato thing. And the same thing with the editing. Is there a certain is there a name for that type of uh, work that you do? I'm sure there is a name. Actually, Danielle uh, Imara, she does most of the editing. And okay. uh, so I would have to ask her, but it's it's like a rhythmic type of uh, choreography of image and sound. And uh, that's that's her style. Uh, it's been fun. We, we've done a few videos together, which, uh, yeah. It, it, it's great. Uh, you, and you can see those videos on, there's a link there on your website to find them. I mean, I found them there. Uh, and yeah. Uh, uh, it's almost like you two are sisters the way you, you know, <laughs> you know, it's clearly like one's, you know, there's a difference between you two, but, and yet, you know, like from a distance, you have to kind of look and focus and say, <laughs> who, who's who? so anyway, uh, and right. the way they do this is they're both filming, uh, in one in New York and one in London. And, and then it's being, uh, you know, edited together to make one kind of story. So it's, it's clever and fun to watch. Yeah. Yeah. But I, you know, I'm still working on life stories. I'm, I'm collecting an anthology of uh, arranged marriage stories and uh, I see my work in the future going more towards looking at other people's life stories. So uh, yeah, we'll see what happens next. And last question, I know uh, from some work that you did, I have, we have a mutual fr friend or connection. I'll ask you uh, what is the five second rule? Oh, <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, I, I worked with Mel Robbins for a while on her show, The Mel Robbins Show. Oh my gosh, she is such an amazing, uh, inspiring person. I loved working on that show more than any other show, I think, just because of her vibe and how she set the tone. But um, yeah, the five second rule, it really means if you have a strong inspiration to do something, just count to five and do it. Don't second guess yourself. Don't stop and weigh up the pros and cons. Just if you have that true gut urge that it's the right thing to do, just count five backwards from five and do it. it it's a little bit like Victor Frankl's um, space in that like Mel's space is five seconds and then yeah. just go and take action as opposed right. to, um, you know, like letting the left brain and the analytical brain think it through until the, you get to the point where you go, well, it's not a good idea. I'm not going to bother doing it. So, right. yeah. <laughs> Very good. Well, this was fun, uh, Yolan. Thank you so much for joining me this morning. I appreciate your taking the time and uh, uh, good luck to you. Thanks for sharing your story. You. And we'll look for more in the Thank future. You. All righty. Wow, that, that was fun. Uh, I was looking forward to the conversation with Yolande, and uh, here it was. We, we we got through it, and I really appreciate that she was willing to just share, uh, you know, that 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 wild adventure story of hers through the 90s when she she married a stranger and joined a cult but here it is 20 years later she survived it and uh is doing quite fine so anyway thank you uh thank you your line all righty uh let's go ahead and wrap up and we'll come back and do it again tomorrow um now uh Tomorrow, we're probably just going to do an abbreviated show. I'll just do a monologue and then get in and get out of here in, in uh, 20 or 30 minutes. Um, Monday, Joan of Angels segment. Tuesday, Angie LaRue comes back. Wednesday, Nikki Roscoe comes back. And Malika, Par I'm going to say this one more time, get that correct. Paranosic. Malika Paranosek. She is a composer living in New York City, and I'm looking forward to speaking her with her next Thursday, one week from today. All righty, everybody. That's it. Have a great rest of your Thursday. Uh, thank you, Yolan, for joining us today, and we'll uh, come back and we'll do it tomorrow. See you guys tomorrow.